Hi there, welcome to the Philosophize podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Fantastic Voyage, a film from 1966. Fantastic Voyage. Uh, this is your choice, Matt, a 1966 film. Tell us a bit about this film. Well, Wikipedia describes it as a submarine science fiction film, which when I saw that, I thought that's a bit odd, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, it's a film about some people who shrink and go inside a body and travel around. Well, they don't shrink, do they? They, they are shrunk. That is... Splitting hairs. On I a think new that's level. important. That you know, you made it sound like, <laughs> "Oh, let's shrink," but no, no. There, there's a quite a long and involved four phase technical process to getting them shrunk. Yeah, that is true. So I remember watching this as a kid. Oddly enough, um, around about the time when in school I was learning about the anatomy of the immune system and sort of watching this and finding it interesting. I mean, there's obviously it's. Not super scientifically accurate. But yeah, I remember watching this as a kid and it occurred to me that I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone about this film. Well, I'd never seen it before. I I mean, I'd heard of it in the back of my mind with many other films that have got the word fantastic in them. And it kind of, it was in my... Con- but I'd never seen it when, when you said you wanted to do this. I was quite excited because I thought to myself, no, I've never seen it. Yeah, and like there's a few... I, well, I watched it with my dad, so my dad's seen it. Um, I've mentioned it to a few people who are into films and only one of them had actually seen it before. Sort of looking at it, it was quite difficult to, first of all, locate the correct film. I mean, it's got a very vague title. The uh, Wikipedia entry, which is a real surprise for Wikipedia, is actually a little bit inconsistent and very... There's not a lot of information and stuff like that. But it was loved at the time, as far as I can tell. Got two Oscars. Did it now? Got Oscars for the art direction and for the special effects, which is no surprise. Absolutely. I know some people will be going, oh, they're not very good now by today's standards and all that. You've got to have historical perspective with this. Uh, they're, They're absolutely stunning. I mean, I still think they're awesome. They are psychedelic. Definitely psychedelic. I think the effects of work, um, the version I watched was the archive.org one. It hasn't been remastered as far as I can tell. And, you know, it's 1966. It's before 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is sort of seen as the landmark sci-fi special effects moment. Um, although, as we discovered on this podcast, things to come was already yep. pretty close to that standard yep. uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, very, very much old school sci-fi, very sort of heady, by which I mean not so much about the plot, although there is a plot. Really interesting, just a, a film dedicated to a supposition. You know, what would happen if we could shrink down and explore the uh, human body? Although one one point of clarification, apparently, um, although Isaac Asimov mo- wrote a book of the film that was released before the film, um, it was actually a novelization of the script. Um, so it's not based on the Asimov book. It is um, the Asimov book is a novelization. He said there was loads of plot holes and he made loads of changes. But uh, you can imagine the, the the typical the typical sort of hipster. Yeah. Uh, it's not as good as the book, uh, which may be true. But actually, the book would be therefore a failed <laughs> adaptation of the film. Brilliant. There, I mean, there there are there are what could be considered plot holes, but um, I think there's ways mm. out of them. But maybe you know that's not really we're not really a plot hole kind of yeah. podcast. So. Um, no. if we come across, if we if we get round to talking about that, all well and good. If we don't, I don't think we've lost. You see, it's our responsibility as responsible film watchers to steer around the plot holes. Oh, I like it. Otherwise, we just break our suspension. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Do you get it? I, I, Do you get I, it? I get it. It's like the suspension of disbelief. Oh, that's and the suspension on your car. Leveled. I like that. I don't. I've got to admit, yeah. I didn't feel and get the full <laughs> weight of that analogy that that ambiguous analogy that polysemous analogy we can reduce anything down any size we want people ships tanks planes general i've heard some wild ones but this takes it we can shrink an army with all its equipment put in a bottle cap that's why we call it combined miniature deterrent forces <sighs> the other side ever gets hold of a thing like that they have but we both have the same problem, lack of control. They can only keep things miniaturized for exactly 60 minutes. After that, everything starts growing back to its original size. I assume Banish knows how to control it. That's right. 
He wanted us to have the secret, not them. That's why they tried to kill him. Right, mate. So, uh, t take us through the plot. Someone gets a sort of a failed assassination attempt on them by the Soviet Union, and the only way to save them is by shrinking people down to microscopic level so that they can fly into his brain and shoot a laser at the damaged at bit the of blood his brain. Clot. Yeah. I'm surprised this hasn't been picked up by modern day surgery, this method, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is also a 60 minute um, deadline, at which point they will start to revert to their original size. So, obviously, for like a whole host of reasons, they've got to get out of this body at that point. Um, unfortunately, there is a saboteur mm -hmm. on board who is trying to stop it from happening. Um, I don't think the film actually gives any sort of background to it, but we're to presume that they are a Soviet spy. Um, another reading would be they're just claustrophobic. And there's various detours while in the, in the body trying to get to the place. They go through various different organs. And um, so they go through the, first of all, it's blood vessels. Then it's through the heart. Then there's a brief stop off at the lungs for some air. And then um, the ear. And then finally into the brain. And then out through the eyes. Yeah, you got, I mean, you get to learn a lot about the different, uh, the cardiovascular system, the lymphatic system. I yeah. felt educated by yeah, that. Yeah, I would say it's probably as close to the biology as Blackadder goes forth as to the reality of the front. Okay, that's good. They do, they do thank the scientists and technicians who made the film possible and um, at the very end of the film with a flashcard. So, you know, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to them. Yeah. Medieval philosophers were right. Man is the center of the universe. We stand in the middle of infinity between outer and inner space. And there's no limit to either. I never imagined it could be anything like this. I always thought it was nothing but red. Only to the naked eye. Those corpuscles carrying oxygen give the stream its color. The rest of the plasma is very much like seawater ocean of life end to end a hundred thousand miles long so dave what did you think you've never seen this before what did you think oh, i enjoyed it straight off the bat this one i thought it was it was wonderful mm -hmm. i mean for uh, i don't know I'm, I'm gonna give you a few reasons i mean the director is richard fleischer and when we were thinking about setting up this podcast i had one of his films in mind so you beat me too, Mr. Felicia. I mean, Felicia is a brilliant Ooh. director. Before this, about 10 years before this, he'd done a version of Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He did one of my favorite films as a kid, uh, The Vikings, which was brutal. He did Conan the Barbarian, the jazz singer with Neil Diamond. But the film that, I've, that, that I thought I'd love to do on this podcast is Solent Green. Oh, is that him? Yeah. And it's, uh, do you know what? Felicia has a directorial style. And I think this film... It's, yeah, what did you call it? A submarine sci-fi? Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, the other influence, I think, that's really, really heavy on it, and you alluded to it when you were talking about uh, the Baines, the Doctor, who's brought back from behind the Iron Curtain, and the possibility of one of the crew members, uh, Dr. Michaels, played by the wonderful Donald Pleasance, as being a Soviet spy. I mean, it's, it's a Cold War conspiracy thriller at base. I mean, yeah. the, the soundscape of it. And the, and the way in which it's filmed, those high camera angles when they're in the base that where you've got the general and the colonel and, and in the background you've got this great depth of field where you can see the, the body of the scientists lying with all the surgeons in masks gathered round them. The mise-en-scene of the base is a conspiracy thriller playground. They pick up uh, the secret agent. Grant, you follow him into the base. He goes down. <laughs> he goes down <laughs> on this uh, sort of like lift with inside the car. I mean, it's 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 got a, a kind of uh, what is it? Uh, Jerry Anderson, the Andersons. Yeah. What are they, what's 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 that series called? The puppets. Which one? The, any you of you mean them. Thunderbirds? You Thank mean Thunderbirds. you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's got a Thunderbirds <laughs> feel to it to a certain extent. Yeah. Um. And you've got this city, I mean, even with traffic cops, you know, underneath this of the, what's it called? It's called the CMDF, the Combined Miniature Deterrent Forces. And, and uh, I think um, the pipe-smoking General Carter 
uh, or is it mm. Colonel Reed? I can't remember. One of them. One of them talks about you know we can reduce a whole battalion into the size of a bottle cap, and you've got this sense of like you know this competition between the Soviets and the Americans with new technologies, mm. you know, and they're both pilfering scientists off each other because Dr. Baines is there in order to solve the fundamental problem that the film has got, which they can only be miniaturized for an hour. So they've got to go in to save him so they can extend it. So, yeah, look, so it's got that conspiracy theory kind of feel to it. And I think you can really see that in the opening sequence. The opening sequence is just wonderful. I mean, there's no voice. It's just noise and visuals. I mean, so what happens is Baines uh, gets picked up at the airport and there's an ambush. And all of this is done by the overwhelming sound of airplanes landing, cars and siren noises, explosions and guns. And there's no voice at all. It's just a pure narrative visual playing. Mm. We get a title sequence and we see Grant being picked up. And it's interesting that he's you know getting dressed. They've just pulled him out of bed to go on this mission. It's time critical. And the rest of the film plays in real time. If you think about it, he's picked yeah. up. Apart from you know, there's editing and montage. It's not a long take. They've got an hour in the body, and they're in the body for an hour. And the half hour before that is Grant being taken through to meet the rest of the crew. The crew being prepped. The the sub being miniaturized in its different phases and being injected into the body. So it's got a real urgency. The narrative of this film because it's mm. playing out in real time. What is it? That blip we're picking up might only be a radioactive particle. The Proteus may already be destroyed. What are you getting at? If I were in their place and I were running out of time, I'd abandon ship before I grew to dangerous size and use the extra few minutes to get out the quickest way possible on my own. Along the optic nerve to the eye. Wait 30 seconds. So this is the first time I've watched it as an adult, and one of the things I really loved about the film is what you already alluded to, which is this um, really long depiction of them being miniaturized. And it, it's sort of an exemplar of um, show, don't tell, because there's no explanation of law or how any of this machinery works. You just see it in operation. You see that because they're so small and vulnerable, they have to have machines to move them because they're steadier than a human hand. And you see that they're put into a massive syringe and then the syringe gets shrunk down <laughs> with them yeah. as well. It's brilliant. And it reminds me, and again, it, it predates this, it reminds me of the Waltz of the Spheres bit of um, 2001, where it's just watching um, ships move and fly and it's for no other reason than to just sort of observe the technology in its performance and i think this film is very much about that as ah, well is it? very good in a sense that goes back to things to come where you've got that second montage sequence yeah absolutely with that dance of the machines the the ballet of technology mm, absolutely yeah there's there's a, a clear tradition this sort of um grounded sci-fi that really is just about an idea and just about the the sheer possibility of what technology can do, that sort of classic sci-fi in it. And there is that opening um, sort of... Um, title the card. There's an opening title card as well. I mentioned the, the ending one, but yeah, there's an opening one. That's the speculative yeah, one. Yeah, and, it, it? and it sort of says, look, obviously there's a space race going on, and that's brilliant, and there's all sorts of sci-fi about space races. This film's going to be about another type of technological race, the race to inner space, which is a phrase that, that is actually used in this film, which I guess is going to be a connection to the, um, I think, the 90s film, Inner Space, Yeah, um, which is a, it's got a similar premise, entirely different sort of film. It's more of a, like, an action comedy. The 1987 yeah. Joe yeah. Dante film, awesome, brilliant. Which must have taken that phrase from this film. Um, but yeah, it's just that sort of like mid-20th century absolute belief in the power of human technology and modern technology that we're going to be on the moon by the end of the century. We can do absolutely anything. You know, why wouldn't we be able to miniaturize ourselves and, and explore the human body like it is a form of space? And I feel like it's, it really is just sort of putting the technology on display just to sort of watch as this engineering takes place. So what did you think about that sequence? I thought it was brilliant. I, the last 60 minutes of the film are in the body, and then they come out of the body, and it's pretty much a, a really brutal, hard end. You know what I mean? There's no congratulations. 
Uh, it's worth saying that the crew um, is composed of four guys and one girl, and there's no romance. The kind of secret agent and the assist and the female assistant don't get off with each other, and they don't have a mm-hmm. love love scene at the end or anything like that. The film just yeah, isn't that's a good point. concerned with any of that at all. It just wants to do the job of sci-fi and explore ideas, philosophic and scientific. And you've talked a lot about the scientific ideas there. And it, I think it does them really well. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point that it doesn't get bogged down. It, it reminds me of um, Star Trek. I've said that over the last few films, I think, but it reminds me of Star Trek in... Hey, these are our cliches. We're allowed them. <laughs> But it reminds me of, I mean, obviously there is romance in early Star Trek. Never serious romance, but there is there is romance. But the earnestness with which it is just about space stuff and, and advanced technology. Like, there's a scene in an episode of the original series of Star Trek where Kirk and Spock and uh, I think McCoy are having a conversation on a turbo lift. And you can see the orange lights in the window sort of going left to right, left to right, because turbo lifts go up and down and left and right. And then at a certain point during the conversation, they start going up again. If you put your finger on one of the schematics that they had at the time of the Enterprise, you could follow them on that turbo shaft and you would get to a junction where it would suddenly start going up again instead of going left to right. And it was it just like that sort of attention to detail of, no, let's just, just film engineering happening just just film the technical stuff that's going on. And without all of the explanation, which you, you were hinting yeah. at, I thought that was... That was really, really good in this. It trusts the uh, viewer to be able to just go with it and not worry too much about that. And it treats the viewer as an intelligent human being that can follow these visual cues without mm-hmm. it being explained to them. Definitely. And sort of to transition to another point, is this is proper sci-fi because it really just, just, it just opens up possibilities of thought rather than closing them down and saying, this is what happens in the lore of this universe. This is what's possible. This is what's not. And I mean, this may sound a bit grim, but biology, our knowledge of the human being, what goes on inside the human being biologically, is based on cutting up corpses. It's based on understanding the human being as though it's dead. And, you know, in the dialogue, they talk about what these characters know from traditional biology, which means you have to kill the thing and take it apart in order to understand what it is. Not that I'm saying scientists actually kill people to perform autopsies. I know there's a lot of people on the internet that would believe that now. Obviously, that's an important function of the benefits of health science and biology and medicine that we have now is that that methodology. But what they're sort of presenting here is what if biology meant going on an adventure, going on a voyage and actually exploring? And there's that scene where uh, the character's saying, we're the first people to actually see the carbon dioxide be released from the blood vessels. And then uh, carbon dioxide go in oxygen go out we're the first people to actually see this and it it is an analogy with space exploration because it's one thing to yeah yeah, i was thinking that as well yeah you you point your radio telescope at a pulsar but it's another thing to bloody go there and instead of looking at it in an abstract way to actually have the visceral experience of exploring the human body in a sort of adventurer's biology instead of the the mathematicians and the autopsers I biology. think um, that's not that, a word, is it? Oh, no. top, so. I'll let, I'll coroner's just, body, the coroner's, yeah. the coroner's biology, the forensic scientists, yeah. and all that. Yeah, <laughs> I know a lot. I think I think the film explored that very well. There's loads of scenes. Uh, but there's one really early on, and a few others when they just move towards the windows and they look out and they're traveling, and you've got all of these kind of like they're traveling through these tunnels with beautiful textures, corpuscles floating around in the plasma. I mentioned it's quite psychedelic, but but they're looking out, and it's almost like a spaceship traveling through space, and people are staring at wonder at the planet. I, I know a lot of tropes of this of Doctor Who. The first time they go into space, and they're on a spaceship, and they look out of a window, the companions, that is, you know, and there's that feeling of awe. Here, because it's the first time any of them have done it, you've got that feeling of awe from the very beginning. Mm. You know, it's something that the character Duval, so the surgeon, the surgeon who's going to do it, he really does pick up on this thread. I mean, there's a, I think he has about four speeches throughout the film when he just talks about the wonder of it. And there's a bit of opposition between him and Michaels. So Michaels is played by Donald Pleasance, who is from the... Uh, Everything. No, yeah. Sorry, no, who's from this, the combined miniature detail? <laughs> oh, sorry, forces. I thought you meant yeah. the actor. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's played by Donald Pleasance. You think from the very beginning, he's going to be trouble. Um, Absolutely. But- I mean, the thing about Donald Pleasance is, as the, you know, the, the ultimate blowfell, 
His name is already a Bond villain name. Yeah. Donald yeah. Pleasance. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's just, I mean, he can play shifty like no one else. Mm. And I mean, he can't, like the film kind of tries to just, you mentioned it before, kind of justify why he is so shifty. Uh, because um, he, he's claustrophobic because during the Second World War, he was buried alive for two days after an air attack in London. But he's always trying to call off the mission. He's always saying, let's yeah. turn back, you know. And towards the end, he even fingers Duval for the saboteur, this person that's sabotaging the place. But uh, Duval, indeed, has been pointed out before at the very beginning of the film, there's some case against him. Again, none of this is explained. And I think this is brilliant, you know. One of the generals, one of the, the it's either the, the pipe smoking general or the or cigar chomping general uh, <laughs> colonel um, says, you know, oh, you know, Duval, he's all we could get. He's a brilliant surgeon, but it's, you know, he's under a cloud. There's, you know, he's being um, suspected of having performed a surgical assassination. You know, so the film set sets him up, and Michaels is is continually kind of like um, reinforcing that, but can't because how Pleasance plays him is as the shifty saboteur. Mm. You, I think I defy <laughs> you know it's him from the very beginning. You know yeah. you've got to. Yeah, you know the on, the only question, and I only realised that it is a question when I was uh, summarising the plot. Is that is whether he actually was a spy or whether he was just claustrophobic? No, I think the the very fact is all that conspiracy theory. The fact that Doctor Baines has been smuggled from behind the Iron Curtain by Grant previously before being driven in the car. There is all of that background of the Soviet and Americans. But is that not precisely creating the sort of paranoia <laughs> that would lead people to yeah. point? Oh, to I know. Good, good. It good. could just be that he's, you know, he's selfish. And he's claustrophobic, and, and he just, just wants wanted. to get out. And it's so, so like, why? It's because yeah, yeah. like he's so he's yeah, so yeah, high yeah. up in this project, you know, which would make him a target for um, for defection and, and turning spy. Admittedly, so I mean, it's it's conceivable, but it's all circumstantial. He's certainly sabotaging the mm, ship. Okay. That's beyond doubt. But why? And the only thing on screen that we get that says this is why the saboteur, the saboteur is that the claustrophobic and the want to go home. They've got there and thought, actually, no, I thought I was all right. Can't do this. Don't care about this bloke. He can die. I want to go home because I'm That's really interesting. That's a, so you can give the film, a, 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 if you like, a, a psychological reading as much as a political one. Yeah, yeah look, I'm going to let that stand, man. I think that's. Uh, <laughs> I think you've, you've convinced me on that point, yeah. I can't breathe. Dr. Michaels. I can't breathe. Dr. Michaels. I've got to get out. i get out. Too late for that. Now we must go on. I'm sorry. I, uh, I got claustrophobia. I was, I was buried alive. An air raid in England. Two days. I thought I'd got over it. Please forgive me. I'll really be all right now. You'll feel better once we're underway. So the other point with um, with these guys is there's some wonderful exchanges between the two. So on the one hand, Michaels, the surgeon, is has got a philosophical, theological kind of understanding of where they're going. And I'll go over a couple of the exchanges, but I think I'll I'll, I'll end with the last one because I just I just think it's really funny. He starts this poetic refrain. It says something along the lines of, yet all the suns, like the corridors of the universe, shine dim before the blazing of a single thought. Grant finishes this off, showing the agent has got a public school background. Uh, but he goes proclaiming an incandescent glory, the myriad mind of man. And Michaels is in the background measuring stuff with his protector and just says something along the lines of, very poetic, gentlemen. Let me know when we pass the soul. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was wonderful, but Duval, right? He won't let you know. He comes back with the soul. The finite mind cannot comprehend infinity. And the soul which comes from God is infinite. And then Michael says, uh, but our time here isn't. <laughs> yes, but our time here isn't. Yes. So again, another <laughs> another put down. So in a, in a sense, you've got these two sparring all the way through, not just at the level of the mystery, the saboteur and all of that. But also, mm. let's say philosophically, Duval, as I said, is a kind of philosopher theologian. Mm. So we get a number of exchanges on this, a um, couple of the others. So Duval says, 
when the, you mentioned before on the exchange of um, of carbon dioxide and oxygen, one of the miracles of the universe, and Michaels says something like, uh, I wouldn't call it a miracle, just the interchange of gases and the product <laughs> of 500 million years of evolution. And Duval is just incredulous. He says, you can't believe that is accidental, that there isn't a creative intelligence at work. So you've got this real good setup between these two. But I think mm. the, the very first one that you get is just Duval on his own. And it's we've just talked about it before. It's when they've just entered the system and they all approach the window and they're all standing there in awe. And he speaks in awe. He says, the medieval philosophers were right. Man is the center of the universe. We stand in the middle of infinity between inner and outer space, and there's no limit to either. So I suppose my question to you is, we've got there a, an explicit mention by Duval of these medieval philosophers. And it seemed to me that in this kind of back and forth that you get between Michaels and Duval, and this is nowhere near an area of my expertise, and you might be able to hopefully be able to say a lot more on it, there's a dialectic between the two of them, this method of almost a dialectical reasoning between mm. the two different positions, the theological, philosophical, and the philosophical, scientific, back and forth between the two of them. There's no resolution, yeah, but we as viewers are encouraged to be able to think through that. And indeed, people like Grant stand in for us. He's, he's always in the background listening to these two, you know, having their exchanges. And it seems to me that you've kind of got this, you know, scholasticism, teaching people, the viewers, the spectators, about the body and about the way in which the body is not the soul and the soul exists outside the body in some way. For Michaels, for Duval, it's it's just nonsense to think that way. So I was just wondering if you've got anything more you can you can extend. Am I right? Is that, is that would you see a kind of scholasticism going on within the body of the film in that way? Is there anything to Duval's mention of the the medieval philosophers, Matt? What? So I think I think the allusion to the medieval philosophers might be a little bit of a red herring. I mean, I think you're right, there is this dialectical thing going on, but the allusion to the medieval philosophers is very much within that character's perception on things. And the reason why the medieval philosophers are being referred to here is because of the Copernican Revolution, which is um, in medieval philosophy, Earth is the center of the universe, and then through Copernicus, through Galileo, through... The, the Renaissance and then on through Descartes onto Newton, the, you get this transformation, in, at least in terms of nature, not putting the human being at the center of creation, although um, the human being does have a very privileged position within that entire way of looking at things because the human is the one who can learn and has been given the gifts from God to be able to learn and understand and perceive what's going on in God's creation. It's kind of a pre-modern sort of, sort of thing. Something's gone wrong with modern philosophy and modern concepts of science because there's only through a spiritual reading um, is it possible to make sense of these things. Where I think the dialectic sits is that it's this idea that discovery and science in a, in a broader sense are not just about gathering data, gathering facts, but about improving and helping us to grow as people and making us better people. And I would say really the motivation there is Socratic which is the idea that you know, through just having a conversation, you grow in understanding and you grow as a person. And the closer you get to true understanding, the better a person you become. And I think you've got lots of different ways in this film of the characters reckoning being challenged because of how there's, there's something that their previous knowledge of these systems didn't capture. Now that they're actually exploring it, that they've, broken this technological barrier being able to miniaturize and explore in a space this is this is sort of forcing people to see the limits in the way of thinking so you've got those the, those two characters there having the debate that you articulated another moment is between the the two generals and it's it's not put in a politically correct way but i don't think there's anything problematic about the message that they're trying to say here so one of the generals uh, it's the one who was always having the sugar and they run out of sugar and then they see an ant and they go with the thumb to sort of smush it very good. 
and then they stop and then they just go back to staring their coffee and you know again nothing said there but you know the the show don't tell thing in this one is excellent you know exactly what's happened then so you know exactly why that's done and then the other general comments on it and he says you know what you're doing there is reminiscent of um Hinduism, because you're showing respect for all creatures, even though really, really small, no matter how small they are. And, you know, and this in a sort of a time in America, I mean, if there's been a time in America when it's never been really certain of its Christianity, I don't know. But, you know, this is um, 1960s. You've got this film where you've got a debate between um, an intelligent design believer and an evolutionist. And then you've got this moment where a general is starting to question their beliefs about the superiority of human yeah. life because he's seen how small human beings can become. Yeah, there's a shift. You're watching the, the perspective shift at that moment. That's really good, Matt. Yeah, I like that. So that, that general has had his reckoning challenge, and he's done so. He's clearly done that to Anne all the time because there's a casualness and a habitualness with which he does that. Um, and then he stops. He says, actually, no, this experience has changed me as a person, and I am no longer comfortable with doing stuff like that. Because I now have a kind of solidarity with the very, very small, and the other general interprets it through a um, sort of comparative religion method. It's a very perspectivalist film. I don't think if that's the right adjective, but you know, it, there's no singular perspective. Doctor, just think of it. We're the first ones to actually see it happen. The living process. You mind letting me in on what's going on out there? Oh, it's uh, just a simple exchange, Mr. Grant. Corpuscles releasing carbon dioxide in return for oxygen coming through on the other side. Don't tell me they're refueling. Oxygenation. We've known that it exists even though we never saw it, like the structure of the atom. But to actually see one of the miracles of the universe, so, Dave, is there anything that you would have liked to talk about that we didn't have enough time for? One of my favourite, um, we mentioned um, Inner Space uh, from 1987, the Joe Dante film, as, as riffing off this and taking these themes. We've also got uh, one of my, my favourite shows on TV, Doctor Who, did a version of this in 1977 called uh, The Invisible Enemy. And... Um, the Doctor, it's the fourth Doctor, played by Tom Baker at that point, and he's, his companion of the time is Leela. They have to go into the Doctor's brain. I'm not going to go into all the details of how you've got the Doctor going into the Doctor's brain. Yep. You'll have to watch it to find out. They do that very cleverly. But they are reduced down and, and put into it, and they go wandering around this brain, uh, the Doctor with his big scarf and Leela with a knife out. And it's absolutely wonderful take on this. And uh, it is the one when K9 entered the show as well. So one of my favourite episodes of Doctor Who and uh, riffing off this film. I'm saying riffing, not ripping. Some people uh, think that when you follow a theme that there's a certain element of ripping off. Um, tell that to everyone that's ever painted an apple. What they're giving is their take, <laughs> giving their take on a theme and i think doctor who does that one with real aplomb uh matt so tell me anything that you wanted to talk about uh, just to round us off yeah i don't think there is a plot hole ah good so what as asimov is wrong there wasn't a plot hole he didn't have to solve the problem yeah. what do you mean well yeah so like plot hole is that the ship and uh, donna pleasant should have exploded through the man's head yeah and made a mess yeah uh, but like the uh, I, can't, I can't remember what they call it, but the Proteus, the, uh, the ships, the Proteus. Is that oh yeah, no, the Proteus. But um, it's a, it's a Type B white blood cell. I can't remember what the the film calls it. The white corpuscle. That's it. Uh, just dissolves it. It's done. Now there is kind of a plot hole there because, um, and it's just because I watched an episode of Star Trek: Deep Space Nine where they get miniaturized. Theoretically, the air that they get from the lungs will be too big for them to breathe in. So if you were going to say that the you know the dissolved bits because you know the um conservation of matter that that matter still goes somewhere you know maybe the particles that have been absorbed by the white blood cell would still get big but particles don't matter in this film because they were able to breathe through the thing so the real plot hole is about the breathing but i don't care it's a good film why does everyone care about these things i, I think uh, asimov tries to solve that one as well uh or something what's he doing trying to solve things 
I, I, I just realised, Matt, I can't say that because I pretended I didn't know about That's the That's all right, I'm going to leave that in. Um, so that they can see how contrived this entire thing is. Like, why are they trying to solve these things? Why is he? Why is he doing that? He, he, like iRobot is like, oh no, iRobot. He writes all these short stories about how robots aren't going to kill us. They are. We are going to die because of robots. Stop trying to. He's that's, trying to solve problems that aren't real problems. That's a bit dark. That's a bit dark way to end. Well, how do you know that that's where we end? Because I'm not going to say anything else. Yeah, but how do you know I'm not going to edit? I'm going to cut out much earlier. I don't, do I? No? No.